Welcome to our workshop on crowdfunding, the second workshop in our Digital Scholar training series. Today's goal is to help you develop a draft of your science crowdfunding campaign. The training video is divided in three sections. A brief introduction to crowdfunding. Second, my colleague Dr. Melanie Funes will explain the USC process by which you can work with experiment and receive donations raised on the platform. And third, we will welcome Danny Luan, the co-founder and CEO at Experiment, the donation-based crowdfunding platform for science research that we are collaborating for this pilot. And Danny will tell us more about the principles and dynamics of successful crowdfunding campaigns. Overall, CTSI and Experiment will help you throughout the process. We will provide individual support for your campaigns, from developing your campaign story and video, to posting your campaigns on Experiment and marketing to help you meet your fundraising goals. So let's start by defining crowdfunding. Crowdfunding is the practice of funding a project by raising many small contributions from a large number of individuals, and these days typically via the internet. Crowdfunding is interesting because it combines storytelling, community engagement, social networking, with a reward system for backers. So there are a lot of components that you need to think about. Crowdfunding is not as new as you may think. In July 1914, as the Statue of Liberty was actually shipped from France, efforts to raise funds for its pedestal stalled. But thanks to a newspaper campaign and small donations of hundreds of residents, the base was eventually built and America's first crowdfunding project was successfully completed. The interesting thing is that within the first five months, the campaign raised more than $100,000 from more than 160,000 donors, including young children, businessmen, street cleaners, and politicians. The Statue of Liberty campaign resembles a modern crowdfunding campaign effort in several ways. For example, the speed with which the money was raised, the number of small donations, more than three quarters of the donations were actually less than one dollar. The fact that the whole process was managed by one agent, at the time it was the newspaper The World. And like many crowdfunding campaigns, the newspaper offered rewards, including gold coins for the largest donor. To fully understand the concept of crowdfunding, it is important to think beyond funding. Crowdfunding will serve you not only as a mechanism to raise funds, but also to increase the visibility of your research. And in our third workshop, we will look at the dissemination mechanisms that you can actually use to do your crowdfunding outreach. A campaign is unlikely to fund an entire project, but it can certainly help you offset scientific funding cuts. The following three examples show you what research groups have raised funds for and may give you a couple of ideas. The first example right here is a research group at Clarkson University in New York. They raised funds to purchase software for mass spectrometry analysis. Another interesting example is master's student Erica Hermsen. She raised money that enabled her to increase the length of her study. So she essentially was able to double her sample size, which is important to many scientists. And the third example that I wanted to share today is Ethan Perlstein, formerly at Princeton University. He surpassed his crowdfunding goal of $25,000 and is using the funds for a series of experiments. Before launching a crowdfunding campaign, it is important to think about any potential intellectual property issues. You can always choose an approach where you do not explain all of the details of your invention or product, but if you do, it is important to think about what happens if you disclose how your invention or product works. So you may want to file a provisional patent application if it applies to your work. You may also think about different types of copyrights. Copyrights need to be honored and they need to be secured for any pictures, copy, video, or songs that you're using. A good example is a recent campaign that raised $10,000, and in the end it was slapped with an $8,000 fine for infringing on a Google image. So it is important to think about honoring and securing copyrights. In addition, keep in mind that other types of intellectual property could apply to your work, such as names, processes, user lists, and digital assets, for example, websites. And all of these can be protected by trademarks, copyright, or trade secrets. And finally, 
The landscape of crowdfunding platforms is evolving. So you have many platforms to choose from, theoretically at least, um, which also means that platforms emerge and disappear. Here are a few examples of popular platforms. At the top, you see our partner from Experiment, formerly Mycorrhizer. And another thing to keep in mind is that not all crowdfunding platforms support scientific research. In fact, one of the best known platforms, Kickstarter does not, unless your campaign is education focused. And with that said, I'd like to introduce my colleague, Dr. Melanie Funes, who will explain the partnership with Experiment and the process for launching a campaign at USC. The first thing you're going to want to do, obviously, is develop your idea, um, develop your project content, get your targets, set your outreach uh, targets. Secondly, you're going to need to apply, and this is an internal application process. There's a form that we've created called the Crowdfunding Approval Request Form. And so you will fill this form out and tell us what you're planning to post onto the experiment website. This gives us an opportunity to internally make sure that we have all of our ducks in a row. So if you're um, doing some funding that could touch on animal subjects or human subjects or any of those things, we're going to look in, make sure that you have all the right approvals, that the university is aware of the research that's going on. We would then send you a notification saying, hey, by the way, everything's checked out just fine. Go ahead and start fundraising. So you would start to fundraise after you've received your you know, campaign target, and let's say you reach your, your funds and you're like, yay, I just raised $10,000, um, you would need to notify your department's business office. And so please go to your department business office. Um, if you don't have a gift account, please ask them to set up a gift account for you. Experiment will be working very closely with us and with the development office and with the business office that you identify in your application form. And we'll make sure that the funds then go to the account that is specified by your business officer. At that point, a university advancement will come in, they'll issue the funds, and you can start your work. So yes? Is there a tax on the account? So the, the way in which the university is going to handle this is the funds that you raise, you'll get the funds that you raise minus 8%. 5% is for experiment, and 3% is the processing fee for experiments processor. And so that's actually on, it's a great question because it's on the next slide. <laughs> so there are several things to keep in mind. First, experiment has a policy of all or nothing. That means if you set a target of $5,000 and you only raise $2,000, you get nothing. Um, you have to raise the full amount. And this is really similar to the way an NIH grant would work. So you can imagine if you, know, you go in to tell NIH, I need $100,000 for an experiment, um, they're not necessarily going to give you $10,000 because it wouldn't allow you to do the full $100,000 experiment. So this works in a similar way, which is why it's really important that when you set that target goal and you set the amount that you want to raise, that you be really realistic about what you think that you can raise so that you can keep the funds that you raise. Um, the second thing to keep in mind is that what you'll get is the total funds raised minus 8%, which covers, again, experiments fee and the processor's fee. And then the third thing is for this particular project that we're doing, because we're, we're thinking of this crowdfunding workshop almost as a pilot. You guys are going to be the first ones that are working with experiment in a university-sanctioned way in conjunction with our provost office and our development team. So we're hoping to learn a lot from your experience. Um, right now, the donations that are received via the experiment website for your projects will not constitute a tax deductible gift to USC. And so this is something important to keep in mind. We're going to make sure, working with experiment, that this is reflected on the project pages of your campaigns. In the future, we're hoping that we will be able to work with the university on a process by which all of these donations would be considered tax deductible. Now, all of the donors that you send to your site, they will receive soft credit and soft recognition by the university. It just won't be considered a tax deductible gift. Any questions about these two issues? Um, some of the university, or most of the university accounts also charge indirect costs. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's something you also have to take into consideration, right? Because if they, that money gets put in, so what you're saying is 8% is less what gets deposited into your account. Correct. And then if you, when you, once you spend that money, the university charges on top of that. So in this case, no. So you can get a separate so account set up for just the, this money? 
So in this case, mm -hmm. the, the funds need to go into a special type brand of gift account. account. Okay. It's a brand new account. There are no indirects charged. Okay. Um, and in receiving the check from Experiment, in receiving the funds from Experiment, the university waives the indirects okay. because it's considered a gift. So in some cases, the university might have a gift fee, but it's usually very small. So and it won't be what you're used to, you know, the 50% right, indirect. Have, for the project we have in mind, we already have a designated, we've been doing some fundraising for it mm -hmm. outside of crowdfunding, and so we have a designated gift account. Then it could probably go into that we account. Yeah, it's first indirect, so oh, you then need to a separate account. Okay. Right. Thank you. Here and then right behind you. Thank you. Do you have to use experiment? We, you, we mentioned that you have to apply for approval and so forth using the experiment uh, mechanism, but can you fundraise by Different, uh, different approaches and not get approval? Uh, so technically, the answer to that is yes. We don't encourage you to do that for several reasons. And part of the reason it's so important that we were able to work with the provost and with the development team and with our advancement team here was that you know, everything that we post <coughs> speaks to USC's brand, it speaks to CHLA's brand, it speaks to who we are as a research community. And so it's important that the university be aware of all of the efforts that are going on. As part of that, the university is working right now to have a crowdfunding platform that's going to be university governed, and that should be rolling out in the fall. Um, we, re we realize that people could go to any, any of the sites. However, then what you don't get is the help from the development team, right? So right now, for example, if a check were to come in randomly from one of these sites, it may take some time for the university to figure out, wait a minute, what is this? How do I process it? In the meantime, you're not getting to start your research. You know, some of the, you might actually make a couple of your donors not very happy because now they've donated to your project thinking that, you know, USC is involved and now USC hasn't even sent them a thank you card. So all these are important factors to keep in mind, which is why we would encourage you to use a process that's been sanctioned by the university where your donors will receive USC soft credit. They're going to be thanked by the university. They're going to be recognized for their donation by the university. The process is streamlined so that you can get your funds quickly. And um, we also are planning a longer term collaboration with Experiment. So in, just in closing, please make sure if you have questions as you're developing your campaign and deciding to post it, you can send uh, Katya an email. Katya is our point person. She will make sure that if it's a question that the eHome team can answer, that it will get answered for you. If it's something that needs to get triaged to me, I will be the point person to work with our development group and our advancement group and with our provost office. So good luck, everybody. I'm excited to see what comes out of the group. And now we are delighted to welcome Danny Luan, co-founder and CEO at Experiment. Danny will explain the principles and dynamics of successful crowdfunding campaigns and help you develop your own. I'll briefly kind of explain what Experiment is and then uh, give an introduction to myself. Um, but I wanted to talk about this project first. Uh, this was actually one of the very first projects we've ever funded on Experiment. Um, it was a professor out of the University of Washington, a paleontology professor and a curator at the Natural History Museum there. Um, it was actually a professor that my co-founder at the time had during undergrad. Uh, and he was out on a dig in Wyoming. Um, it's a place where most of the fossils in North America come from, and he literally walked across the like, big brill of a triceratops in the ground, uh, but didn't have the time to bring it back. And so for him to go back out there with a team of grad students to excavate it, bring it back, um, use it for teaching, use it for research, was $2,000. So uh, it wasn't worth the trouble of going through a, a typical grant, um, but it was still a non-trivial amount where he needed uh, the resources to go out and, and bring it back. And so this was the ideal candidate for crowdfunding. Uh, after we launched this project, he had, I, I believe, 38 backers fund this project uh, to raise the $2,000 to get a U-Haul truck. And then uh, there's a Triceratops fossil specimen now back at the Natural History Museum at the University of Washington. And so the funders have been able to come in and actually be a part of the preparation, see it up close in person. And, and that is what Experiment is. And uh, just a bit about uh, our background Experiment. Uh, we're currently based in San Francisco. Um, and we're uh, a for-profit uh, organization, but we kind of think of ourselves as this hybrid, uh, mission-driven um, website organization, uh, specifically to help scientists fund research that would otherwise go unfunded. So Experiment uh, is currently the world's largest platform for crowdfunding uh, research. It's the only crowdfunding platform that is specifically designed for science. Um, I know we previously referenced uh, two other websites, Petri Dish and Siphon Challenge. Just a side note that I want to include, uh, Petri Dish is no longer around. Um, and Siphon Challenge is actually hosting their crowdfunding campaigns on Experiment. 
Um, but that said, there are some 30 other uh, crowdfunding websites and platforms. Um, some of them are specific to cancer biology and others are specific to ecology, um, but there's many. Uh, and here are just some statistics and metrics about experiment. Uh, so we've been around for a little over two years now, and uh, we've so far had over uh, $1.1 million in transaction volume go through the platform. Um, we've funded, it's actually 192 projects now. Uh, so these stats are old as of like two days ago. Um, and uh, one slight metric just about the team. So we have six folks at Experiment, uh, but we have a PhD dropout rate of 66%. Uh, Not to say that we couldn't finish PhD programs, but that uh, we were on the track for you know, grad school and doing research and, and one day um, kind of being where you guys are. And this for us is a solution uh, to fixing some of the problems that we face around funding. And so if we weren't doing Experiment, we would be still in research. So that's what that metric is supposed to show. Um, all right. Uh, so again, just a breakdown of the process. Um, researchers post projects in, in uh, search of funding. Uh, backers around the world can contribute to them directly. Um, once the researcher has gotten the funding, then they share the progress on experiment. And so we'll talk a, bit, a little bit about that, what that looks like. Uh, and then in the end, researchers are sharing the kind of final results of what came out of these projects um, directly with their stakeholders and funders on experiment. Um, we have over 150 research universities right now represented uh, on experiment. And we've done now probably 10 or 12 uh, more formal partnerships like this one we're doing today uh, with more universities. And this is something we're really excited to do. So any chance we get to do these kinds of workshops and meet with you guys face to face is, is great. Um, cool. Uh, all right, so we'll talk a little bit now about the kind of nitty gritty. And then hopefully at the end of this, we'll have enough time to go over a question and answer. Um, and so a question that you guys have probably gotten and if haven't asked you know, yourselves is why crowdfund your science? And so there's a lot of immediate kind of direct benefits to crowdfunding it's separate from just the funding. And so the biggest and most important one that uh, you're going to hear me reiterate a lot is the community and awareness and the direct connection. And this is by far the most important impact um, and kind of effect of crowdfunding. Um, it's a human impact. So this is something that we've seen uh, with scientists that it, they, they come to us after having funded a project on experiment saying that it's changed their perspective of how they view their research because other people um, whether it's strangers or friends, are funding their science. And so this is something we feel very strongly about. We think that every scientist needs to experience this before they die um, because it's very, very impactful. Um, and it's different than kind of how you do your, you fund your research and start it and how you share it with your stakeholders uh, traditionally. Uh, another big benefit is that it's flexible to fit your research. So this is very refreshing compared to traditional, I guess, grant writing, uh, where oftentimes your grant will shape your research. Um, crowdfunding allows you to put your science and your research first. And so this is a platform specifically for your science and the story around how you share that science. So it's a huge benefit, um, primarily also for being able to get preliminary data uh, for projects that then could scale towards a larger uh, goal. So that's something I'll talk about in a second. Um, obviously, most of you probably know crowdfunding, uh, the big benefit as virality and awareness. So uh, starting to leverage an audience that's bigger than what you would normally get, um, that's a huge benefit and, and that does happen for crowdfunding. That's one of kind of the drivers of what makes it tick. Uh, and lastly, it makes your science go faster. So different from, I guess, how you would be traditionally funded, uh, this is a chance for scientists to kind of put your scientific impact and your destiny uh, in your own hands. So instead of kind of hoping for like a kind of a, you know, not, not necessarily transparent um, process for getting funding, this is a way where your science communication impacts your ability to do more science. So uh, conversely, uh, there are a few risks about crowdfunding, and those are things that I have to address and bring up. Um, you can't treat it like a grant. So just like with grant writing, it's good to like try a lot of stuff, and with crowdfunding, that's the case. Um, this is not a set it and forget it effort. So this isn't something you can just kind of put online and, and expect people to understand it and fund. This is something that takes your active involvement through the, the entire process. Um, another big risk is that uh, there is no set kind of formula for crowdfunding. So while flexibility is a benefit, it also means that there is no um, kind of rule book that you can follow that will guarantee a successful crowdfunding campaign. And so because of that, uh, certain projects may be predisposed to be more successful crowdfunding, whether it's the, the topic or the researchers involved or just timing and luck. Um, but those are things that you have to, have to recognize. That's a risk. Um, and then also, it's public. So if you're a researcher who's shy, um, maybe crowdfunding isn't necessarily for you because crowdfunding does require you to put your science out there. It requires you to kind of step out, um, engage in ways you're not, you know, maybe you're not used to. Um, but that said, 
If this is something you've been wanting to do for a while, this is a fantastic forcing function to get to starting. So we've had researchers, tenure faculty come to us saying, I've always wanted to use Twitter, I've always wanted to blog and be more open, uh, and crowdfunding has helped me start that. And now I have an audience and a seed of a group um, that I can work with. So uh, hopefully you'll see by the end of this that the benefits of crowdfunding greatly outweigh the risks, and it's something that uh, you would consider. And so again, uh, this is the point that we'll try to bring up again and again. It's that uh, the outreach comes first. The science communication and the awareness in the community, um, that's what makes science crowdfunding successful. And so this is a little bit counterintuitive um, if that you kind of accept the fact that the funding isn't necessarily what you're going for. The goal is science communication and that if you're successful with that, the funding will follow. And so this is something we've actually seen. Of, of the 200 researchers we funded, um, the ones who are more likely to succeed are the ones who kind of do it regardless of the funding. But then inevitably they get funded. So that's just something to keep in mind. And this will be something that we'll talk about again. All right, so uh, now we'll talk about a few examples just to kind of illustrate what Experiment does and, and kind of examples of crowdfunding. Um, this was an early project we funded a while ago. Uh, a University of Washington professor um, who actually approached us and when we received this project, we thought it was a typical kind of science project. We figured it would get funded within like 30, 40 days, the typical time frame. Um, but this was a researcher who was, uh, had a proposal to monitor uh, a proposed coal transportation line on, through like trains through the region. And it would affect a lot of like residential communities. Um, and when this project launched, it got funded within seven days. So they met their initial like $20,000 goal and then some passed that. Uh, but this was a really interesting project in that it was the perfect mix of the right problem um, in that this was a really interesting, like it was a, a scientific problem that had a scientific approach. Uh, the right audience in that once the local community caught wind of this, it just exploded. Um, you know, people started talking about it on blogs and forums, local radio, local TV, uh, and then the right researcher. So this researcher in particular had a huge background and uh, a lot of experience um, in local atmospheric pollution. Uh, and he kind of positioned himself as, we want to be the ones to, to help find the answer for this, uh, this project. And so the outcome uh, was that he shared a lab note. So this is, these are lab notes, a, a feature on experiment where researchers share their process. So a lot of like progress reports, um, whether it's images or videos or data. But this is the final one that he posted where he actually shared that the, the research and the data that they gathered from their crowdfunding campaign had been published uh, in an atmospheric uh, science journal. And then that uh, paper had been taken to policymakers to influence this proposed coal transportation line. So this is an impact of, from beginning to end, uh, the kind of the impact of what you know, crowdfunding with the right mix of variables can, can achieve. Uh, this is another project that is a little bit more fun. Uh, so this is one that was two graduate students out of the University of Connecticut. Uh, and they were studying this adorable uh, squid. So it's a tiny little squid that has bacteria, it's like a symbiotic relationship uh, in the gut of the squid that causes it to glow. And so no one really knows why these bacteria choose these hosts and how that relationship works. And so these two graduate students needed to raise funding for materials uh, and field study work, I believe, to carry this out. So ju for just $5,000, um, it could fund this project for like half of a field season. And so uh, this project was really great because uh, in addition to putting the science out there, they also invited the public and the backers to be part of the project. So it was really kind of cheesy, but uh, they actually invited their backers to get, to, if they fund a project, they get to name a squid uh, that they were growing to collect samples. And so this project ended up having over 200 comments of just people engaging with this project. And you can see the researchers um, having conversations. It, this is too small to see, but um, these are all ones that I wanted to highlight. One of them was just a complete stranger who was a huge fan of cephalopods for 15 years or something. And this was a chance for her to finally be involved with this project. Um, another person uh, at the bottom, someone said like, PZ Meyer said to support this project. So I, I'm assuming you'll do well, so good luck. Um, so various people for various different reasons are getting involved, not just through funding, but also wanting to be a part of the project. And um, this is one of kind of the showcases of if you invite people in, uh, then good things happen. And again, uh, these are lab notes from this project uh, where this researcher was able to share uh, not just kind of what you would think of as traditional like scientific output, uh, but things like images, videos, animated GIFs, um, things that kind of created this uh, network that her backers could uh, you know, share a common interest in. 
Cool. So uh, now we'll talk about a bit about your uh, crowdfunding campaigns and, and what goes into, uh, what are all the building blocks, what's the recipe, and, and what is required for a crowdfunding campaign. Uh, and then while we're doing this, I'm assuming that you guys have uh, this like exercise uh, checklist, and so you can do this alongside, and we'll have a few breaks to like talk about it and ask questions. Um, and so putting together a crowdfunding campaign requires a lot of kind of strategy, and just thinking of what are all the right pieces that you can put together in terms of the things that go on experiment, so the content, uh, which we'll talk about all those se sections separately, um, as well as off experiment, so stuff like planning your launch, planning um, your outreach strategy in terms of uh, the right communities, uh, who your, where your networks are, who they are, um, and then as well as launch. So launching your crowdfunding campaign is uh, the biggest, most important step, and we'll get to that. So starting a new project. So if you go to right now, experiment.com slash start, uh, that'll take you to a page where you can um, click a button to create a project, and you will see this uh, platform. So uh, this is how we actually break out all of the different sections of content, and we kind of walk you through this process of putting together uh, a basic project description, a budget section, uh, a researcher biography, all the stuff that makes a compelling crowdfunding campaign. Um, we kind of, we do a lot of work behind the scenes to, to help you craft the perfect one. And so uh, we actually currently on experiment, our team vets every single project that comes through the platform. So we look at three very basic criteria, uh, not any sort of qualitative review, um, although it's something we'd like to do in the future. Uh, we just, right now, we vet for identity, um, so the basic fraud element, making sure all these researchers are who they say they are, uh, that it's actually research related, so it's not raising capital for a startup, or it's not raising money to teach a class, but that there's a research question driving this project and that the research goals are uh, not so lofty as we're going to go to the moon, but that the researcher has the right resources, experience, and expertise to uh, meet the goals. And so if it passes those three criteria, which is uh, a lot of what our team does, then we'll actually then uh, also start to curate and help you kind of with editorial feedback. And so the title of a crowdfunding campaign is where it all starts. And so this is different than naming, maybe it's not so different than naming your grant, but it, it shouldn't be any different from how you would describe your research to your neighbor or your friend or someone who isn't in your field. And so what we often tell researchers and what we encourage people to do is to be very, very concise. Uh, a title is meant to be the starting point for your project and it's what hooks people in. And so just some very technical guidelines, uh, you know, six to eight words is really a great length for titles, um, enough to be descriptive, but then also avoiding technical language, uh, which would throw someone off. Um, and so here are some examples of just really great titles that we've had. Um, this first project, Azola, a little fern with massive green potential. This was a sequencing project that was going to uh, take a small fern and share all of the sequencing data on experiment. Uh, the calf connection, California humpbacks and their Costa Rican nursery. It's just a very kind of descriptive and um, fun title. Or you could just be like straight up, like very concise. Building a gel imager on a budget. Uh, that's a project that I think most of you would be interested in learning like how they're going to do that, why they're doing that, uh, why this is important. Um, and that's what a good title can do. Uh, as well as something like chemically sterilizing mosquitoes to prevent malaria transmission. This was a project that was also funded on experiment. So um, a good title can serve to describe what the project is about, give someone enough uh, interest to then learn more about it. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so I can talk about categories right now because we're going to go through kind of chronologically the uh, project creation platform. So uh, every project on experiment uh, can pick two categories. And so uh, most of the categories are ones that are kind of well known like biology, medicine, uh, ecology, as well as things like uh, kind of more untraditional like art and design, um, anthropology, political science. And so we're always growing the number of categories. Um, and so that's something to think about because then when you search for projects on experiment, they'll actually be grouped by category. Um, and so, uh, interesting statistic, it's actually projects with videos are 55% more likely to succeed. So if you are going to go through all the trouble of launching an experiment campaign, uh, putting together a video can greatly increase your chances and is definitely worth it. Um, and so we'll talk about probably how to put together a video, I think, afterwards. And I think USC is going to be offering uh, help with this. Um, and just kind of technical guidelines. Uh, two to three minutes is a great uh, kind of target for your first video. It can be as simple as you literally in front of your laptop uh, web camera and just you know talking to the audience. Um, we've had pr uh, videos that have had kind of high production value, but 
high production value doesn't necessarily correlate with a greater chance of success. It ultimately comes down to what you say in the video and uh, what the project is about. And oh, of course, you'll see this in two examples, but uh, if you're excited in the video and, and you are passionate about that, then it's easy for other people uh, to also be passionate, also be excited, and, and want to be a part of it. So I should mention we have a section on the site where you can actually upload a video, uh, and it's very seamless, and then the video will just be in your project page. Hi, everyone. I'm Brian Clark, and a grad student at California State University in Northridge, studying the reproductive behavior of giant sea bass. Giant sea bass are the largest bony fish found in California's kelp forests. They are long-lived and grow to extreme sizes, with the largest one ever caught being 7 feet long and over 500 pounds. Because of their extreme size, giants became a very popular trophy fish throughout the 20th century, and unfortunately, this significantly reduced their numbers in California to almost zero. This landed them on the IUCN Red List as a critically endangered species. Many regulations have been placed in California to try and stop this massacre. Giant sea bass serve an important role as apex predators in the kelp forest community, and without them it would cause detrimental effects to this ecosystem. I believe that studying their reproductive strategies and behavior allows for a better understanding of how this fish functions. This knowledge will promote awareness and allow for better preservation and protection of this species. I will be going out to Catalina Island from May to September 2014 to do my field research at the Long Point Marine Protected Area where they have been known to spawn. With your support, I will be able to purchase a data logging hydrophone allowing me to obtain passive acoustic data and I will use this to find out the time of day and how many giants are reproducing. Also, as a contributor, you will be kept up to date with messages and photos from the field. Thank you for checking out my project, and please share this with any friends who may also be interested in protecting the endangered giant sea bass. Cool. All right. So that was just one minute, 53 seconds. Uh, one thing I just wanted to point about that video, it was very, very clear, very short. Uh, there was no sense that he was really dumbing down his science. He was just being very kind of honest and direct. Uh, and of course, at the very end, he had a very specific ask. It wasn't fund my project. It was actually share this with other people you think would be interested in this. So that, we'll get to that in a second. Uh, that's a fantastic way to engage people to ask for help. Um, and then this next video is actually a little bit longer, but uh, this is arguably like the best video we've ever had on Experiment. This is not the, this is not expected of everyone, but uh, this is something that uh, it was a project we funded a while ago. It was kind of very special. So. Can I ask, was he successful? He yes. Successful? Yeah. This is prion protein, or PRP. You have this protein on the surface of your cells. Everyone does. It's encoded by a gene in your DNA. This protein has a unique ability to fold up the wrong way. And once it does, it causes other copies of the protein to do the same thing. The misfolded proteins can spread across the cell and across the brain killing neurons, and ultimately causing death. This is called a prion disease. Prion diseases can be acquired, most famously, from food contaminated with mad cow prions. They can be sporadic, meaning they happen spontaneously, or they can be genetic. People with mutations in PRNP, the gene for prion protein, can be healthy for decades, but then suddenly they get sick, and once the disease starts, it's fatal within about a year. Right now, there is no treatment or cure. This was the happiest day of our lives, our wedding in August 2009. It was also the last time I saw my mom healthy and happy. A couple of months after we were married, my mom started getting confused. She couldn't remember things. She lost her appetite. She continued to decline rapidly. She couldn't talk or feed herself or recognize family members. Soon she was on life support and we were still completely confused as to what was going on. In December we got a preliminary diagnosis of krausfeldt jakob disease and just a couple weeks after that she died. A few months later we received some more bad news. She had actually died of a rare genetic prion disease, fatal familial insomnia, and I was at 50-50 risk of having inherited the mutation. We decided that we wanted to know. We had me tested, 
put a blood sample in the mail and received our results. We learned that I have the mutation. A few days after we got the news, a scientist friend said to us, I told them, science has answers for you. It was the first hopeful thing that we'd heard. I was really more interested in trying to get them to look forward instead of thinking that this was game over to get them to thinking that there was hope and the hope wasn't just maybe one day someone will find a cure but the hope was that they could find the cure. We weren't scientists, we didn't know anything about prions so we started reading Wikipedia trying to wrap our minds around scientific papers, badgering our scientist friends to answer questions. People were amazingly generous with their time. I quit my job and started going to classes at MIT and at Harvard Extension School volunteering in a neurogenetics lab, and eventually working there taking care of patient cell lines. I had to wear sneakers every day so that I'd be able to run from place to place because I was trying to cram so many science-related activities in. I quit my job analyzing transportation data and got a job analyzing genetic data. We started a blog, CureFFI.org, where we've tried to collect all the information in one place to make the resource we wished we had when we were starting out. We started a nonprofit, Prion Alliance, so that we'd be able to fund scientific research. And now we need your help to launch this project. Onla 138B is a brand new compound that was just invented. It may still be a couple years before it would make it to clinical trials, but if it works well, we want to help demonstrate that and push it along. Onla 138B has been effective in vivo against a strain of infectious prions, and we want to know if it will be effective against genetic forms of the disease. That's why we've teamed with Dr. Armin Giza, the compound's inventor, and Dr. James Mastriani, a scientist who created a model of GSS, another genetic prion disease. This study will test his compound in his model. This isn't the last you'll hear from us. We have lots more plans in store, and we won't stop until these diseases are cured. But let's do this now and get some answers. Are you afraid? No. We're going to own this. That was great. The ending is always great. Cool. Uh, all right, so just as an update, these guys were fully funded. They actually raised three times past their goal, testing three promising compounds with three different labs. And they're actually both uh, starting PhD programs at MIT this fall. So those guys are awesome. Cool. All right, so those were examples of two videos that were very different, but they're both equally as impactful in terms of helping researchers meet their goal. Uh, the second video is obviously a bit longer, and that's um, kind of what happens when you're able to put this cohesive story together, and that's something that any researcher can do. It just takes time and effort and uh, practice. Um, and so hopefully those can help you guys think about your videos. So now we'll talk about the budget. So this is, uh, I know this is a very frequent question a lot of researchers ask us, saying, I've got this grand idea, but how do I know what the appropriate size is, or what is like the first chunk? Should I think about this in multiple phases? Um, and what we've actually found is that uh, if you think about your budget in terms of defining discrete amounts of science, um, that helps readers and audience members understand what the project's actually about. So in other words, define actions. Saying that I'm going to use this funding to go out to the field to gather this much data is very different than saying we want to understand a theory for how giant sea bass reproduce. And so that's something that uh, is just very kind of in the habit of transparency. Um, you can define things like materials costs, travel costs, publication fees. Those are all uh, acceptable kind of line items that um, people have put for projects. Um, and then again for the budget section, transparency and uh, kind of honesty with what you're spending the money on is, goes a long way towards building trust with uh, potential funders. So being able to see that, is, that's not something actually the public really gets access to. Um, this is a, kind of a new dimension for that, that crowdfunding brings in to understanding what science is, is really just understanding like what are the costs. And so this is a really important part of having a good project. Um, and then lastly, the budget section, uh, in addition to having a budget breakdown, there's also a synopsis. And that's a fantastic place to kind of make your appeal as to why this project can't happen without them. Like what about this piece? Is it just like, you know, one piece of equipment or it's one, you know, travel cost to go to the conference to share your awesome work. Um, that's kind of like the magical piece that if you could get someone to see that, um, then, you know, they'll think, I want to fund that piece. I want to make that happen. And so here's an example of just a simple kind of budget breakdown. This was a project we funded that was actually a um, 
it was through a class doing science communication, uh, but you can actually see that some of the costs were publication fees, survey costs, um, et cetera. And so we, we kind of put this up on the project page to make it very transparent. So this is just a very quick breakdown of all of the funded projects that we've had on Experiment. Um, and so uh, this is a, a few months old. Um, we've since funded like 50 more projects, but uh, you'll see that some of the, the largest projects were over $25,000, um, around $29,000. And most of the projects, the average kind of site-wide project size is uh, less than $5,000. So right around like 4,800 bucks. Um, this is because we encourage researchers to start small, uh, particularly if it's your first effort with science communication, public outreach, um, and also kind of to increase your chances of being successful. Um, I know one question that often comes up is, uh, what happens if I set my project at $10,000 because that is the smallest amount of funding that I, I need, um, but I get to $9,000? Uh, that actually doesn't happen on experiment. So most of the projects that fail on experiment never get past 10 or 15% of their funding goal. And so what we actually see is that there's kind of an increasing likelihood the close, uh, of success the closer you get to your goal. And the part of that is because of social proof. So when someone sees that your project is at 70 or 80%, they're more likely to fund it than if it's at zero. Um, but the other big indicator is uh, researcher effort. So if you're not you know, trying to get past the first 10% of your, your goal, then it's highly unlikely you'll get to 40, 50, 70, 100%. Um, and one thing this uh, graph, this breakdown doesn't reflect is uh, stretch goals. So we actually also have a feature that if you go past your initial funding goal, you can set subsequent goals saying, sweet, we've got this initial phase with another you know, X amount of funding, we can unlock this extra dimension to this project, and that, that works. So it's a way to kind of constantly increase uh, you know, your scientific impact. One note, you can have as many collaborators on an experiment project as you want. Uh, we typically have one uh, project leader, so like a lead investigator of sorts um, for every experiment. Um, and as part of the biography, it's always a good idea to include uh, your titles, your positions, your appointments, experience, degrees, anything that helps kind of um, lend credibility. Uh, and then also we have a short uh, summary section that's a little bit more about you. So why you got in this field, um, why are you interested in this? Why have you, you know, a scientist, presumably devoted 15 years of your life to studying this one tiny thing that you, know, you must be very passionate about in order to do that? So expressing that um, helps, under helps other people understand more about the project. Uh, and then also the last one is a little bit of a joke, like what are your interests outside of science? Which is supposed to be a joke because scientists don't have interests outside of science. But uh, one interesting note is that if you actually say that, for example, like I rock climb on weekends, uh, then rock, other rock climbers are actually more likely to fund you because you share that in common. So being able to kind of share that about yourself, um, that's something that doesn't traditionally happen, again, through like funding a giant you know, black box of a, you know, agency. Instead, if you're funding someone who's a human, and you can convey that like, you know, I like dogs, and this is you know, my dog, a link to a picture of my dog, that's something that the public can again engage with. And so that's actually worked. We actually have had a project that was a rock climber who was a field ecologist and then got other the rock climbing community because apparently he was really famous uh, to fund his research. So that happens. Uh, so this is just an example of uh, one of the earlier examples that I showed you, just the, the Coltrane project. So this is um, a kind of very typical example of a biography, but this was one that was specifically catered towards his background, his experience, because this was a project that did have a huge public uh, audience. He did have to you know, show his, prove his credibility um, in his background. And so uh, this is kind of typically what you'll see on an experiment page. Um, it says, I'm a professor at the University of Washington, an expert on air quality. Uh, the rest of that is just kind of his background. Uh, cool. So does anyone have questions about that? OK, all right. Uh, so now we'll jump to. Uh, Science content. So this is the last piece of what goes into a, a successful experiment campaign. Because for us, the big success metric isn't whether or not you reach your funding goal. It's actually what kind of awesome science content can come out of your project. So whether it is a published paper in a peer-reviewed journal, or whether it's just an awesome video of you underwater swimming with a giant sea bass, um, that's what we want to pull out and, and share with the backers, because that's ultimately why people fund these projects. And so. So in terms of what is appropriate to share and what are you allowed to share and what can you share, some of those questions are best answered maybe by your department uh, and not necessarily us. But one thing that we encourage is for researchers to share what's appropriate. And so keeping in mind uh, your audience that you're talking to, it might not actually be relevant to share like the secret sauce of your IP. So 
that would kind of render that uh, you know concern moot because um, you don't need to talk about like why this works or potentially the the thing that would get scooped. And so frequently people come to us thinking that's a concern, but it's actually not that big of a concern. Uh, you just need to talk about why it's relevant. And so that said, once you do share this stuff, this content, um, that then becomes ammo for how you share outside. So social media, Twitter, Facebook, um, that's kind of how it's meant to be done is that during the campaign, you can share lab notes such as methods, protocols, um, you know, histories of collaborators, where you're doing, where you're going. All the stuff that wouldn't fit into a project page is fantastic um, as lab notes uh, on experiment. And so uh, during the campaign, like I said, you can share what you've done in the past. Um, the stuff you can't fit into a project page, and just add a level of depth to the project. And then after the campaign, uh, the content is entirely about the results. And so not necessarily results in just um, here's like the raw data, interpret it for yourself, but really working with your funders and stakeholders to help them understand what the results mean. So why is it meaningful? Um, how can it be interpreted? Uh, and ultimately, like what is you know what new doors does it open up? Um, we've had projects that were funded once, and then after they, they kind of published the results, they said, hey, that was phase one. Now we're actually ready to do phase two because all these other doors opened up. And because they already had that seed community there, they were just able to turn on a switch and then have them all back <coughs> again. So we funded projects um, successive times uh, on experiment. And so this is just an example of a lab note. Um, this is the, a sample lab note from the Prion project that we showed you. Uh, and this is just them sharing their preliminary data um, so not all of it, not enough to be kind of IP sensitive, but enough to show like, um, you know, where this is going and what this means. And so uh, ultimately they actually, just their results, they showed um, in their, their mice models uh, that it was effective in actually reducing plaques in the, the models, the mice that had um, the prion disorder, but it didn't reduce mortality. So even though their kind of big question was a no in terms of it didn't work as they hypothesized, it actually opened up another question of, well, why did it actually, why was it effective in reducing plaques, but it did, didn't reduce mortality like we thought? And so that could be a subsequent next phase. And then the last part is the launch. And so these are all outlets that have covered experiment projects. Um, some of these you'll know, like Nature and Science. Some of these you won't know, because they're much more obscure. Uh, but this is like the big, kind of what the buildup is for, is um, launch and be heard. Uh, People love to hear from scientists. And so all of these outlets, outlets who've covered scientists, some of that was from experiment, um, doing outreach on their behalf. Some of that, a lot of this was from researchers just like reaching out to journalists in their field. Um, and that works better than anything we could do because people love to hear from scientists. And so that's why these get covered. And lastly, so this is after you launch. This is a dashboard that will show you on experiment that gives you a full breakdown of kind of detailed stats, but then also uh, analytics, so where people are coming from, we give you a list of traffic sources, how many page views you're getting a day, um, just to kind of correlate your outreach efforts with how well it's working. So ultimately you'll know with the funding amount, like how close you get to your goal, but you'll know that, hey, I posted this thing on Reddit and it got 5,000 page views. Uh, something must have worked. <coughs> and that's happened. We've actually broken the site numerous times because of Reddit. Cool, so now we'll talk about specific case studies and um, We'll just go through a few examples to give you a breakdown of what actually happens during a crowdfunding campaign. So uh, the mechanics here are on the left axis, you'll have the uh, funding amount raised. And so that's the yellow line showing progress towards our goal. And on the right is the number of page views. And so the blue area graph is the page views. And you can actually see uh, this for us is a typical crowdfunding campaign. You get two very big spikes, one in the beginning, the launch, and one at the end, the final push. Um, this almost always happens. Uh, and you also see uh, for this one, there is kind of very steady uh, progress in terms of their, their f uh, the yellow line. So their initial target was actually $4,000, but then they went past that with a stretch goal. And so around day 28 uh, is when they broke through and then they just kept going because of all the momentum. Um, and this yellow line for us kind of represents uh, an ideal crowdfunding campaign in that it's very steady and consistent. Most campaigns aren't like this, uh, which you'll see in a second. Um, but this particular project, just to give you background, uh, this was a researcher out of the University of Washington who was studying uh, how pet visits impact uh, child, children, cancer patients' uh, rate of recovery. Because this was something that was very controversial, there was very little literature, uh, great candidate for crowdfunding. And they were also featured on local TV. 
this is another case study. This is a substantially bigger project. Um, this is one that raised uh, over $25,000. And you'll actually see that the number of page views, there are way more spikes, or bigger spikes. So this project had more traffic. Um, and this, for us, kind of shows if you start to go above $15,000, $20,000, the dynamic changes a little bit, where you'll notice uh, a few very large spikes. And so for those large spikes, that was actually kind of pre-planned um, outside relationships where they had existing grants that came in. So there were three donations for this project uh, that were over $1,000. So two were $5,000 grants, and one was from like uh, a large, we call them angel funders. Um, but after their initial launch, that those big spikes are really what kind of propelled this project and kept the momentum going. And then you'll see that this was just kind of a, a long, steady marathon of here. Uh, and then there's a the final push. And so another theme, you'll see that in a second. And so here's one uh, case study of another fairly large project we funded. This was actually a researcher uh, who was out of the University of Alabama um, who was going to correlate uh, teen gun violence uh, incidents with local state gun laws. And so it actually in 1998, the federal government banned all federally funded research relating to gun violence for some unknown reason. Um, and so this researcher literally had nowhere else to turn to just to examine this data. And so this was actually right after Sandy Hook. It was very publicly relevant. Um, and because this person just wanted to, it was basically data that was sitting there that no one was touching, um, she felt that for $25,000, she could fund a grad student and herself to do this work outside of her university just to like, get that data out there. And so this one you'll actually notice. Um, in our version of the slides, we actually have each of these uh, asterisks is labeled. But each of these big spikes corresponds to one of these news outlets. And so I believe this one was, uh, let's see, this one was like Nature, this was Slate, um, this was the BBC, and like this one was the New York Times. So the New York Times was just a very small mention on a column. Uh, and it didn't bring that much traffic, but you can see just how much funding that brought. So this is a really great illustration of not just doing kind of blind outreach, but doing outreach in the right places and the leverage that that can have. And so this pie graph uh, represents the breakdown of traffic. And so the gray slice is, represents direct traffic. That's traffic that we can't necessarily correlate to where it came from. But the second biggest one is direct, so email, um, or just people going directly to the link. Twitter, uh, Google search, surprisingly. Uh, Facebook, Reddit, New York Times, Think Progress, Nature, Slate, and then AL.com. So uh, this one you can actually very kind of clearly pinpoint which outlets contribute which amounts. And this is a really great example if you're thinking over $20,000 or $25,000, how to kind of strategize um, hitting the right outlets so that uh, it's all just kind of a matter of momentum. So Experiment itself has a few social media channels. It isn't enough to get a project funded, and we, we don't want scientists to think about that. But we can feature projects on our homepage. We feature projects on our Twitter, our Facebook, our mailing list. So like we have a 20,000 person mailing list. Um, and that can be called upon to help you know, get some momentum. Uh, as well, what we try to do more of instead is to help you think about like, which outlets should I be reaching out to. And that's a hard question if this isn't something you've ever done before. So for example, like, do I reach out to the New York Times when I'm at 0% of my funding goal? Probably not. If I'm at 90% of my funding goal, that's something we can actually help with. And so uh, we also help you craft press releases. This is something that we can do for every project where if you need it at the right time, um, we can help you wordsmith one, or we can just spin one up for you really quickly. And so uh, a lot of the help and assistance that we provide is just meant to be like strategy to help kind of be cheerleaders. All right, uh, so this is just a very small uh, chart of a small subset of funded projects on Experiment. So um, on this graph, you'll see the total funding raised. And on this, you'll see the total number of donors. And so the slope here represents the average donation for this subset of projects. So these are only projects that are under $4,000. And I will admit the subs this uh, data is fairly old. Um, but this is a good exercise just to think about in terms of your funding goal, uh, is to realize how many backers you might potentially need uh, to fund your project. And so our site-wide average right now for all of experiment projects is actually $98 for every donation. Um, but it's bimodal. So we actually have a lot of donations at the $20 level and a lot at like 150 level. Um, so obviously, they're different groups. One comes from um, kind of outside traffic and strangers, and one comes from maybe networks and people you know and colleagues and other scientists. Um, but this is a really good kind of way to think about 
like how much, where you should set your funding goal and funding target is realistically, how many people do I know? Like if I'm gonna set a $3,000 target, do I know 50 people who would fund this project? Or is there a community of at least 50 people who would fund this project? Um, that's one way to think about this. And here's another graph of the same subset of uh, funded projects. Um, instead of, so this is total raised, but this one is actually total page views. So unfortunately, there's a very kind of big outlier here. Um, but if you look at this slope, the slope actually represents um, the average amount of money that comes in per page view. And so if you actually remove this outlier, the slope starts to go up and then it actually looks closer to one. But for this exercise, uh, this means 24 cents per page view uh, for these campaigns. So that's another good way to think about it is instead of um, also just the number of backers is how many eyeballs do, would I need to get for this project? Um, and so this is just a good exercise to think about. And lastly, uh, this is just a small collection of funded projects. Um, they're daily fundraising totals. And so uh, this one was actually uh, Ethan Perlstein, um, his Crowd for Discovery project that he raised over $25,000. Um, and the rest of these are uh, experiment projects. Um, you'll notice that there are some high outliers. Those are typically the beginning and end days of these campaigns. That's when most of the funding comes in. Um, but this is just to give you a rough idea of like how much you could expect or kind of where to benchmark your daily progress on experiment. So if you're getting you know, a few hundred dollars a day, um, that's a good place to be, uh, but it, it changes. So this is just kind of to help you understand. Cool. Uh, social proof. So this is something I just mentioned um, previously, is that your likelihood of success of being funded uh, currently, just if you launch a project, is 40%. So in other words, 40% of the projects that launch on experiment ultimately succeed. That means 60% don't succeed. But of the projects um, that su don't succeed, uh, you'll see that your likelihood of success goes up a lot with every kind of milestone that you reach. So if you reach 10% of your funding goal, suddenly your chances of success go up to 64%. If you reach 20%, that becomes 80. And if you reach 40% of your funding target, then you're 92% likely to succeed. So this is kind of like an upward curve. So this is expected. This is really ultimately kind of social proof illustrated, where um, the closer you get to your goal, and uh, the, the more likely it is that you'll meet your goal, but also it kind of shows just how hard it is to get to the first 10 or 20%. And if instead of thinking about how do I get to this big 100% multi-thousand dollar level, uh, if you think about how do I get to 10% first, um, then you're much more likely to succeed. And then that kind of chunks up um, your fundraising strategy. So again, this is just tactical uh, kind of perspective. Um, but this is across all projects as of a few days ago. Oops. Uh, cool. So some of the stuff that I mentioned um, you might have pulled out. But these are just some sample strategies in terms of like, what can I do for my campaign? Now you're thinking, OK, these are the elements. These, this is the data that I should kind of put myself up against. Um, how do I make this work? Uh, and so some of the stuff that uh, USC has been offering today is actually assistance from your institution. So whether that's with video production um, or can, you know, getting featured on your department page, that's something that you guys can do um, very easily. Uh, press and journalists is something that we've talked about. Those are often kind of levers of after you've met um, you know, 10, 20, 30%. And once you start to build momentum, those are great uh, ways to, to keep that momentum going. Um, getting outside the office is something I should talk about. Because we've actually had researchers print off their project page with links and go to a conference and like, hand out like, paper versions of their web page. Um, and it worked. That, that, pro that researcher ended up getting funded. Um, but that is a, a really like, to the extreme illustration of uh, your likelihood of success increases with the more that you start to put yourself out there. And it's just half of crowdfunding is kind of showing up. And if you just even go out with something that isn't necessarily perfect, um, you know, like a small paper flyer, that's enough to kind of get the awareness out and get people talking about it and get people excited about it. Uh, also leveraging your backer community. So uh, this is something that I kind of hinted at early on, is that if you actually make your ask to certain audiences or communities for help, then they'll be much more likely to engage. So for example, if you send uh, an email out to a mailing list asking people to fund, it's less likely to get people excited than if you ask people to, to contribute ideas of where this should be, how others can get involved, um, and bring in more participation. So it's kind of like the saying, if you ask for advice, you get money. But if you ask for money, you get nothing. Uh, and that's very much true with crowdfunding. Cool. 
so this is a slide just for some common questions. Uh, there's a few points that I probably glossed over. Um, and so these are just kind of the headlines. So uh, where do most backers come from? So you're probably wondering, like, what's the demographic of a lot of these funders? Uh, the majority is um, first, second, third degree networks. Uh, so the first 30% of a funding goal um, is that researcher's immediate network because those are the people most likely to trust you to fund this project. Um, but for projects that are over fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000, the percent of you know, strangers um, goes up a lot. And it should also be noted that a lot of the funders are also scientists. So maybe they were former scientists in a past life or they used to do research or their colleagues you know, directly in this field and they want to be involved. So we've had researchers uh, post projects and then someone come out of the blue and say, hey, I'm also a cancer biologist. So she was commenting on a protocol that was posted as a lab note. She said, I'm actually an expert in this field. Like, why are you doing this? Have you thought about this, this, and this? And suddenly the researchers responding and they're collaborating out in the open about the design of the experiment. Um, that's something that's potentially exciting. Um, so something to keep in mind. Uh, backers becoming scientists and scientists becoming backers. Uh, what is the fee? Um, so the 5% is just a small fee that helps keep our servers running. Uh, it currently doesn't support all of the site, um, but we hope that at scale uh, that will. So this is just kind of for transparency so you know what the fees are. Um, can I have multiple campaigns? Yes, we talked about this. It's not a good idea to have multiple campaigns at the same time, um, mainly because your focus on getting them funded should just be you know, in one place. Uh, and the all or nothing model, uh, as I've shown, um, it is all or nothing, but projects very rarely kind of get to 90% and, and don't make it. Um, and yeah, and the IP aspect. Uh, so you'll be working with development folks here and probably your departments to figure out what IP is appropriate. 